Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Chairman and the Trustees of the Thistle Trust, may I welcome you once again to the Robin Chapel here in Edinburgh for our afternoon service. Our service today marks the second Sunday in the season of Lent, and I'm Dr Ian Barclay, the Chaplain. It gives me great pleasure to be able to welcome as our preacher today the Reverend Adrian Van Ash, Minister Emeritus of the Scots Church in Sydney and a long-time personal friend. Adrian, you are most welcome and you are amongst friends. It also gives me great pleasure to welcome back Gail Begg as our reader. To you both, thank you for sharing in the ministry and worship of the Robin Chapel today. I would also like to thank James Slimmings, Sally Carr, and Callum Robertson, who over the past months have been so supportive in sharing in ministry at the chapel. Please accept my appreciation. So in the awesomeness of the gospel, let us worship God. Lent calls us to journey, this and every day, following Jesus wherever he leads us. Lent calls us to journey, to the place where God covenants with us, to receive the new names we are given. Lent calls us to worship together, to tell future generations the good news. Lent calls us to practice justice, to bring God's people and hope together. Lent calls us to be faithful living, to trust the one who gives life. Lent calls each of us to take up our cross, to trust the one who bears it with us. Lent calls us to journey with God. Let us now worship God, the one who walks with us on this and on every day, and let us do so together. The bidding psalm is Psalm 19, to be found as hymn number 10 in the Revised Church Hymnary, 4th edition. The stars declare his glory, and it will be sung to the set tune, Gibson.
the sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord, who is full of compassion, and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Amen. Let us offer our prayers of approach, of confession, and receive absolution. Let us pray. Long before the change of name, before the first signs of new life showed the beginnings of promises fulfilled, you asked Abram to make his home among foreigners and share the blessings that was to come. And now, O oh God, you ask the same faith of us, the faith to count ourselves among the least, to find our place among the broken and the poor, the faith to trust in your mercy and your promises and to share what we have received, the faith to wait expectantly for your reign of justice and equity, together with those who most need its gifts. Teach us to be children of Abram, sharers of the blessings we enjoy, the blessing of plenty shared with those who have need, the blessing of healing shared with those who are sick and wounded, the blessing of joy shared with those who celebrate, and of tears shared with those who grieve, the blessing of friendship shared with those who are excluded, and of solidarity with those who fight injustice, the blessing of peace shared with those in conflict, and of confrontation shared with those who bring harm. And in some small way, may our faith and our sharing help to bring your promises into being in our world. And this we ask in Jesus' name. And we confess. Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, yet we trust in our own works rather than in God's grace. Jesus calls each of us to take up our cross, yet rather than allow our selfishness and sin to be put to death, we cling to what we know. Jesus calls us to follow him, yet we fear where faith will lead and what it might change in our lives. In this moment of silence, we confess the sin that separates us from one another and from God. People of God, hear this good news. God's covenant with us is true. God is faithful, even when we fail. Through the Holy Spirit, God gives us the gift of faith and makes us righteous. Believe in the good news that you are forgiven, set free to live as children of God. Amen. And thanks be to God for his grace and mercy shown to us through his Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Our lessons from the Old Testament and the Epistle will be read for us today by Gail Begg of the Thistle Foundation. 
Gail. Our Old Testament lesson today is from Genesis 17, 1 to 7 and 15 to 16. Hear the word of God, the covenant of circumcision. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will become the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Amen and thanks be to God. The Robin Chapel Music Group will now sing the Magnificat from the setting for the short service by Orlando Gibbons. My soul doth magnify the
need to hear the word of God from the epistle of Paul to the Romans, chapter 4, verses 13 to the end. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depended on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but also of those that have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will create who, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins, and was raised to life for our justification. Amen and thanks be to God. The Robin Chapel Music Group will now sing the Nuke Dimitis from the setting of a short service by Orlando Gibbons. Lord, Let us hear the word of God as it is contained in the Gospel of Mark, reading from the 8th chapter and from verse 31 to 38. Let us hear God's word. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciple, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. 
you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angel. Amen. May God add his blessing to that reading of his own holy word, and to his name be all praise and glory. Our anthem this week is a sacred motet based on Psalm 117, verse 1. Confetimini Domino by Palestrina. Confitemini from Waterview Heights near Grafton in New South Wales, Australia. The title I have taken is comes from the Mark reading, Mark 8, 13. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? So what good is gaining the world? I've just finished reading Geoffrey Archer's The Fourth Estate, which being, being since the French Revolution is considered the media. It is a story about a Czech Jew who escapes from Nazi-dominated Europe to join the British Army to kill Germans. The other is an Australian who is loosely based on Sir Rupert Murdoch. They become competing global media magnets. By any standards, they become very wealthy and successful men, but never satisfied nor seem to have a settled personal life of comfort and peace. They are both liars, manipulators, bending the law to breaking point, and are ruthless. In the end, the Jew finds himself in such a tight financial situation that he commits suicide. They epitomize gaining the world and losing their souls. In other words, their focus is just on worldly success and hang the consequences. However, is there more to consider? 
Our text does imply an existence beyond this world, the abode of the soul. It further suggests that this can be lost depending on how we live in this world. So, let us then consider this morning's reading to see how they address earthly success and the eternity of the soil, soul, by considering them under the following headings, the covenant, faith and grace. The covenant. In our lesson from Genesis, El Shaddai, or God All-Powerful, makes covenant with Abraham, and his name is exchanged to Abraham. Up to this stage, the name of God was only known as El Shaddai, for the Tetragrammaton, or Yahweh, had not yet been revealed. That had to wait till God meets with Moses at the burning bush. Moses had been faithful to God since he had been called out of Haran in the Ur of the Chaldeans. He was a nomadic herder, and while God had promised to give him many descendants, his only born son was Ishmael, by his wife's servant, Hagar. We are told he is now 99 years old, and Sarai was really beyond childbearing age. Yet Abram believed God, and Sarai's name is also changed and becomes Sarah, and both form of the names mean princess. While Abram had become wealthy and remained a humble man who served and dedicated his life to God, God had called him to follow his ways and be blameless. His dedication was tested when God asked to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. With heavy heart, he prepared the sacrifice only to be stopped by an, an angel of the Lord. His faithfulness is now rewarded by being again promised that his descendants will multiply and they will become nations. God confirms this in making a covenant with Abraham. And who can doubt these promises? Anti-Semitism is an evil thing, and we have seen the full horror of that during the Holocaust. Yet what is evidence from this, that indeed the promises of God have come true, and his descendants have become numerous and nations? While Lot discovered the evilness of humankind, Abraham remains faithful, and that is counted as righteousness, and as such is saves his soul to eternity. While Abraham believes what God has promised, he demonstrates his faith in God Almighty. So let us look at faith. The days of Abraham were in the distant past when Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome. The time had changed and the Jews were no longer the sole guardians of God's truth. Jesus had come and the worlds had changed forever. Now it was possible for non-Jews to become children of God and these were some of the ones Paul was now writing to. The Jews had become so obsessed with the law that it clouded the true nature of God and his relationship with his people. Paul, having been trained as a Pharisee, knew well these legal and religious arguments, but Christ had called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles, and how could they then become acceptable to God? As a consequence, he goes back to Abram and explores how he was made just with God. When Abram lived, he, as the other Pat patriarchs had a direct relationship with God, for God's law had not yet been promulgated. Paul knew that the religious leaders had amplified laws into so many ways by establishing additional regulations that nobody could possibly comply with. 
They had placed tremendous burdens on their fellow Jews. The Sabbath had over 600 rules to be observed. Yet this did not make them right with God, for that could only be done through Jesus Christ. As a result, Paul saw clearly what the law had done was to drive the people further from God, for it had all become too hard. Paul argues that Abraham believed, and this was counted as righteousness. At this time, Jews still believed they had to earn merit with God, but this all changed with Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Abraham came as a result of believing in God rather than in the possession he had gained in his earthly life. That God counted his belief as righteousness was an example of the grace of God, so let us consider grace. Jesus is with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi, and for the first time Mark has him tell them what must happen to him. He must suffer. It is not surprising that Peter, who has claimed him in last week's lectionary as the Messiah, the Son of God, now seeks to castigate him that what he has just said. He will never let it happen. Peter was still thinking of all this in terms of the Messiah re-establishing the Davidic kingdom and tossing out the Romans. Yet Christ's ministry was about a different kingdom, which was not limited to this earthly existence. Peter, with the other disciples, found this hard to comprehend. So Jesus rebukes him and tells him to get behind him, Satan. We probably see this in two sharper terms. There is good evidence that would suggest what Jesus was saying was really, get behind me, Peter, get back into your own place and follow me. For Peter was still adhering to the human conception of the Messiah rather than the things of God which Jesus was revealing. Jesus knew the evil which had always perverted the ways of God, and it would now lead to his death. Things were not going to change before the time when God would make all things new again. So his followers would also have the need to cope with evil which would surround them. Therefore he warns his disciples that they must be prepared also to take up their cross as they follow him. So Christ is starting to paint the eternal future which is not determined by earthly success, but by faithfulness. A willingness to follow Christ and serve God overcomes whatever obstacles are placed in front of our respective pilgrimage and sacrifices that may need to be made on our pilgrimage. Those who lose their life for Jesus will gain it in eternity. He draws the sharp distinction between earthly success and the salvation of the soul. These, of course, are not mutually exclusive. Wealthy people can have and do serve the cause of God and still remain faithful. Yet it is also true that the pursuit of earthly success can crowd out any thought of faithfulness to God. Jesus reminds his disciples, as he reminds us, that we should always look beyond this earthly life and keep in mind that we are all serve our eternal God, who wants us to enjoy this life and his eternity. We have been saved through the grace of by sending Jesus to die on our behalf so that we may be righteous in his sight and become citizens of heaven. Let us then, during this time of Lent, rededicate ourselves to his service 
and strive to be the people for whom Christ died. Amen. Let us pray. We pray to the Lord for courage to give up other things and to give ourselves to him this Lent. Give your church the courage to give up her preoccupation with herself and to give more time to your mission in the world. We pray for the congregations of the Robin Chapel and the Independent Presbyterian Congregation of Grafton in New South Wales. May the blood and water flowing from the side of Jesus, bringing forgiveness to your people, help us to face the cost of proclaiming salvation. Lord, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer. Give your world the courage to give up war, bitterness and hatred and to seek peace. Especially we pray for all countries who are involved in conflict. May the shoulders of the risen Jesus, once scourged by soldiers, bear the burden of political and military conflict in our world. Lord, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer. Give us the courage to give up quarrels, strife and jealousy in our families neighbourhoods and communities. We pray for families where the stress of this pandemic has become too much for them and they have resorted to abuse, to violence and to breakdown. May the presence of the risen Jesus, his body once broken and now made whole, bring peace and direction as we live with one another. Lord, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer. Give us the courage to give up our selfishness as we live for others and to give time, care and comfort to the sick, particularly those suffering as a consequence of this pandemic and for whom we now pray in this moment of silence. May the wounded hands of Jesus bring his healing touch and the light of his presence fill their room. Lord, meet us in the silence and give us strength and hear our prayer. Give us the courage to give up our fear of death and to rejoice with those who have died in faith, especially those we hold in our minds at this time and remember before you in this moment of silence. May the feet of the risen Lord Jesus, once nailed to the cross, walk alongside the dying and bereaved in their agony, and walk with us and all your church through death to the gate of glory. Lord, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer here and in eternity. 
And now hear us, Father, as we pray together in the manner that we have been taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever. Amen. Sadly, we now come to that moment in our service when we shall be led in worship in the closing hymn, which today is 533, Will You Come and Follow Me? To the set tune, Kelvin Grove. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be in you and you in me. Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare? Would your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you? Will you let the blinded see if I but call your name? Will you set the prisoners free and never be the same? Will you kiss the leper clean and to such as this unseen and admit to what I mean in you and you? Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you? Lord, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you in this day and always. We now come to that moment of farewell. And in giving a farewell, I do so firstly to Adrian with our thanks and appreciation for his sharing the Word of God with us in our worship this afternoon. Thank you, Adrian. 
We would appreciate if you would convey to your congregation in Grafton and New South Wales the Christian good wishes of our chairman and trustees and also of myself. Secondly, I would like to thank Gail Begg of the Thistle Foundation for being our reader today and for the uplifting Ministry of Music of the Robin Chapel Music Group. Lastly, I would like to thank each one of you for sharing in our online service week by week and becoming part of the Robin Chapel community. Our service next Sunday, the third Sunday of Lent, will be at the usual hour of 4 p.m. Till we meet again next week, I pray that you will stay safe and that you will serve the Lord with peace and with justice. God bless you all. Goodbye. <laughs>